Traumatic brain injury may occur as a result of a sports injury, a car accident, or just a fall in our homes. Learn about coping with traumatic brain injury and advancements in that field. Traumatic brain injury, tonight on call with the Prairie Doc, celebrating our 20th season. Thank you for joining us tonight as we continue with the 20th season of On Call with the Prairie Doc. Hello, I'm Dr. Deb Johnston. Over the years, I've seen many lives altered by brain injuries. Today, people are able to survive injuries that years ago would have been fatal. Joining us tonight to discuss the medical responses to brain injury is Dr. Adele Sheikh from Avera Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation in Sioux Falls. And via Zoom is Dr. Christina Sanders from Monument Health Neurology and Rehabilitation in Rapid City. We look forward to answering your questions about brain injury. Call 1-888-376-6225, send an email to ask at prairiedoc.org, or ask our Prairie Doc Facebook page. Those of you who ask questions during the first 20 minutes of tonight's program will be entered into a drawing for one of our Prairie Doc gift items. The winner will be announced at the end of this program. Your question will remain anonymous, but be sure to provide your name and contact information when you submit your questions so we can contact the winner. Welcome Adele and Christina. I am so excited to have you guys with us today. This is going to be a, a, such an informative, such a very, very important topic. So I just can't wait to hear what our listeners and viewers want to hear about it and can't wait to learn from both of you. So uh, Adele, I'm going to start with you. Tell us a little bit of the basics. What is head trauma? What is brain and traumatic brain injury? So traumatic brain injury in simple terms is when you have a change in function of your brain as a result of an external force. It's different from brain injuries from internal aspects that can cause damage to the brain such as tumors or vascular pathology. Okay. And Christina, I understand that we kind of separate brain injury into two different um, mechanisms. Can you tell us a little bit about how um, closed head injury is different from penetrating head injury and what that means? Absolutely. A closed head injury is uh, primarily used to describe an injury in which uh, the skull is maintained or essentially the brain uh, doesn't leave its area of enclosure. So um, these injuries, if you will, um, a lot of times have better recovery outcomes because the, the skull continues to encompass the brain. Uh, whereas penetrating wounds um, or, or open wounds, as sometimes they can be called, um, often uh, result in a disruption of the brain parenchyma as well as the bone uh, and, and the fluids and matter around it. And so those injuries can be significantly more debilitated from a medical standpoint uh, in terms of management. So Adil, what kind of um, activities can result in brain injuries? It's a very good question. Um, the activities are usually defined in three different age groups. And so you have the really young kids under the age of four, and then you have kids that are aged four to 18, and then you have the older people. And the number one reason for somebody to have a brain injury in most age groups are falls. And, that, and second to that is car accidents. Now in that younger age group, um, we have what we call mild brain injury or concussions that occur a lot more also just because of their ability and their activity in sports. Okay. Um, and I know that pediatric head trauma is kind of close, near and dear to your heart, Christina. So um, I, I was talking with a parent recently who said, so what, what kinds of things, sh my, my kid falls all the time and hits their head all the time. When should I worry? When should I take that kid into the doctor? 
Yeah, that is a, an excellent question. And a lot of times I will tell parents that really depends on the child and you really need to rely on your instinct uh, as to what we would call traditionally appropriate behavior. Some of the more obvious signs um, would be what we call a change in mental status or a change in neurologic status, meaning that after a fall, after a motor vehicle collision, after any type of direct impact to the head, you want to look at if your child is able to maintain eye contact with you. If they're aware of their environment, if they display forms of recognition to things that are very common. Um, if your child is not doing these things, that's something that you would want to have urgently evaluated. I always tell parents, is your kid acting like themselves? You know, is, is there something different? Is there something that's making your mom or dad instinct tingle? Or are they just acting normal? And if they're acting normal, I'm a lot less worried than a kid that's not acting normal. So. Absolutely. And our, no. our brains, believe it or not, our brains uh, and our skull at young ages are really designed for survival. So if your child is, uh, you know, crawling and, and they're nine or 10 months old and they crawl off the bed or, or they're walking and they fall, the, these are um, areas of velocity, if you will, that are not likely to result in a direct impact to the brain itself versus the head. So honestly, one of the things that I tell my patients uh, when, when they present with concern is uh, if you see a goose egg on the outside, uh, it's a good sign versus a goose egg that might be on the inside. Um, so I'm actually a big fan of bumps or bruises because that tells me that uh, those areas of swelling are kind of outside the skull, outside the cranium, if you will. And, and uh, believe it or not, uh, in, in a doctor world, that's a good thing. Especially on the forehead. Bru yeah. bru bruises on the forehead of, of children are uh, a lot more reassuring than bruises. For example, if you see a bruise behind the ear, mm. that's a bad thing that needs to be checked out. You Absolutely, I think, I think uh, Christina had, uh, was kind of alluding towards that direction when she says goose eggs on the inside. You know, you can have bruising behind the ears, around the eyes, some dripping of fluid from the nose, or if they fall and they hit their head, and what you alluded to earlier, if they have a penetrating injury or signs that a skull is depressed, yeah. that's when you need to take that child Absolutely. or adult into the ER or have a physician assess them. Yep, and and that the bruise behind the ear, the bruise bruising under the eyes, the drainage of fluid from the nose, blood or, or clear fluid, um, can all be signs mm. of a skull fracture. And so those are the things that make us nervous as physicians. So. I go take my child to the emergency room um, and I have a CAT scan and the CAT scan's okay. Does that mean that I don't have to worry about anything? No. <laughs> <laughs> if you ask the question. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> yeah, that was a leading question there, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but, but I think that that's mm -hmm. a very typical thing that parents sometimes think, well, I had the CAT scan and everything was okay, or I had the MRI and everything was okay, so therefore I don't know what's wrong with, my, with me or with my child because, you know, I, my scan was normal. I can't have a concussion. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, this, this, the answer is going to be multifaceted because number one, a CAT scan is not as sensitive as an MRI. So you could see some damage to the brain tissue in an MRI that may not show up in a CAT scan now. Yeah. The fact that the CAT scan is normal is also very reassuring because a lot of the really bad brain injuries or moderate brain injuries will have signs on the CAT scan that the physician or other providers can look at. Now, the third thing is, look, if this initial CAT scan is normal, you still have to watch the child very closely because there's some aspects of brain injuries that show up few hours or even a day later. 
if they have a really tiny bleed that starts to develop over the next few hours, you have to watch your kid to see if there's any changes in how they act or the alertness um, or if they start having some sort of weakness because sometimes those bleeds are so small they take very long to start showing their effect. And once they do those effects can be catastrophic. So that's, that's a really important thing and the CAT scan is the MRI shows us a lot more but the CAT scan is really good at showing us bleeding and when you look at management, emergent management of head trauma bleeding we worry a lot about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we worry a lot, Absolutely. a lot about bleeding. So, great. So, um, we have some questions that have come in for us here. Uh, and this is, this is a good one. Um, someone from Sioux Falls wants to know, is there a link between childhood head injuries and Alzheimer's disease later on? Christina, what do you tell your, your patients about their children? Yeah, so um, the, I think the short answer is no. Uh, we don't have research to support um, kind of that level of linkage between being so young uh, and, and advanced um, uh, mechanisms of, of brain deterioration. However, what we do know is that children that sustain mild traumatic brain injuries, um, which there are several criteria, but one of them is having a negative uh, CT scan, uh, is that children that, that receive three or more um, mild traumatic brain injuries um, over the course of their lifetime can go on to have difficulty with learning in the forms of attention uh, versus inattention versus um, uh, what we call working memory, which is your brain's ability to carry over uh, information in a sequence. So we can see delayed um, kind of uh, effects um, as children grow and develop. And a lot of that is dependent on when those injuries occurred. What do you tell your adult patients? So if, am I still susceptible to those things? Right, and, and like Christina said, the evidence is not there. I know um, in, in people that play sports, um, there is that risk of CTE, which is cerebral traumatic encephalopathy that occurs later on in life, you know, in, in their 40s, 50s, 60s, where they have a higher risk of cognitive issues, agitation, not feeling that great. But in, in the adults, um, other than that aspect, you know, there, you know, some people say, hey, you know, is there a link between ALS or some other autoimmune diseases? The evidence has not shown that, uh, but there are case reports about it. So, you know, if, if I have an adult patient that comes in with multiple concussions or mild traumatic injuries, I will tell them to stop doing the stuff that's causing some of these things and use preventive measures. You know, be safe because, you know, your brain is something that's not easy to fix, unlike the rest of your body, whether it being arm, legs, abdomen, the brain is just, it, you just, a lot of times you have to rely on its own recovery. And you only get one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and I think that CTE is, is more awareness of that now uh, with those professional football players that have come out and talked right. about their experiences. So it's a very important topic. Mm -hmm. Prairie Doc reporter Carter Schmidt brings us the story of Gabby Holty, who suffered a traumatic brain injury as the result of a motor vehicle accident. Twice a week, Kathy Holty and her daughter Gabby drive from Jackson, Minnesota to Sioux Falls for Gabby's therapy. Her life changed drastically in June of 2016 when she was in a serious car accident. Brain trauma. Um, Lots of injuries. Lots of injuries. Lots. <laughs> Almost died. Almost died. The accident happened only a mile from her home. A large pickup going 50 miles an hour ran a stop sign and crashed into the car in which Gabby was a passenger. She had what they call a diffuse brain injury, so not one specific spot of injury. Um, she had 17 brain bleeds. 
her aorta had a shearing injury, um, which they stented and grafted. Um, she, both lungs were partially collapsed. Her spleen was ruptured. Her liver was cracked almost completely in two. Um, her pelvis was fractured. She had um, spinal fractures, but it was on the processes of the spine, so nothing that compromised her spinal cord. Um, her, we found out about three days after the accident, you fractured your right wrist. Um, I can't lots remember. Lots fractured ribs. Um, <laughs> yeah. So she had about five hours of surgery um, the day of the accident. To, and then they didn't even close her up. They left her open for a couple days um, in case they had to go back in and fix any other bleeds. I don't think anybody expected her to make it. Gabby also suffered a stroke five days after the accident. It pretty much decimated the area of her brain where speech is believed to be. Um, yep. And so they told us after her accident that she would probably never speak, probably never understand what we said to her. However, Kathy says that is not the case since Gabby has come such a long way in her recovery. The 28-year-old now has a job at a coffee shop and loves to ride her horse. She even has a tattoo of her favorite books on her arm, though it provides more than decoration. Cover up my scars. Um, crash into uh, you a lot of glass. A lot of glass. Kathy says Gabby is her hero. She doesn't give up. We always talked about the power of yet. She'd try to say, yep. I can't do something, and I'd say, you can't do it yet. <laughs> yet. And so um, we've worked really hard. The thing we prayed for from the very beginning for her was independence. And that's what I want for her, is for her to be independent, yep. do things on her own. Maybe someday even live on your own. Maybe yet. What an amazing young woman. Wow, that is really a story of uh, tenacity, determination, uh, support. What a great story. Um, how important is having that kind of support for a patient recovering from brain injury? You know, it, it's, it's everything. I think there's really good data and really good studies that show that people that have a good support system, whether it's parents, spouse, significant others, other relatives, just help people get better. And it, it's for multiple different reasons. It's because, number one, they motivate them. Number two, they feel like they're not alone. They, they, they get, the mood is better. And then, and when they leave the hospital, things around the house and around the society and environment are set up for them. And they're prepared for some of these things that uh, uh, a patient with brain injury may have. Um, and that's similar with other issues too, including strokes. All the data is very strong. And, and Gabby was very happy. Um, uh, very lucky, I would say, to have such a great family and good support system, apart from her being a great person. Yeah, just, just amazing. I think that that idea of the power of yet is just such a powerful idea. So may all of our patients have her drive and um, her family. So, and right. what a huge difference in society as a whole in the time that I've been practicing medicine. I'm a little older, I think, than both of you. Just how we have come to try to support and integrate people that have these injuries into society at large. So it's really an amazing thing. So um, we have some more questions. And I think this is a, an interesting question. Uh, we were talking a little bit earlier about some of those more mild injuries. Um, and someone from Brookings wants to know why people who have had concussions are asked to avoid televisions and screens. Christina, that sounds like a great question for a pediatric PM&R doctor. Yes, ma'am, I am ready. <laughs> you know, traumatic brain injury rehabilitation has really come a long way. And every three or four years, there are 
large international conferences. Uh, one of the most notable ones is the Zurich Conference, um, where we kind of make these global statements on um, traumatic brain injury, mild brain injury, how to manage it. And there are a couple reasons why we say to avoid screens. Um, and, and the other thing is that the management of mild traumatic brain injury is changing. We're learning more that an increase in oxidation to the brain, um, the ability to uh, have more symmetric movements within the body can actually have a, a positive response to a brain injury. So we no longer say um, a, as a medical collective that you need to stay in a dark room and uh, keep your eyes closed and never come out and not engage in society uh, during the time of your brain injury. However, um, very quick lights uh, especially blue screen lighting, uh, can actually activate the brain. So it, it um, acts as a stimulant uh, versus something that would have a calming effect. And this can amplify some of the side effects uh, that you experience with a brain injury. The other thing that we're seeing um, that's a little bit of an aside is with the use of cell phones as they become smaller, and a little more intricate is that the what we call the fine motor movements um, so the nerves that control the muscles especially within the eye or at, are at a one-to-one -one ratio and those fine motor movements as you scroll scan across the screen uh, can aggravate some aspects of brain injury such as headaches um, loud sound amplification and visual changes. So a lot of times as physicians, we start off with saying, please avoid these things. It doesn't mean that you can never ever use them again, but your brain is working on getting better while continuing to participate in its environment. And that can be a lot. It, just like any other injury, you need to rest it while it heals. You can't keep stressing it. Someone had a question here about uh, foods. Are there particular foods that can promote healing for the brain? Well, you know, there's some data saying omega fatty acids help. Um, you know, whether it's omega-3, 6, omega-9s, they all seem to have some evidence um, I'm not sure if the evidence is overwhelming, uh, but you know one of the things that uh, there is evidence about also is avoidance of some foods. And there's there's a there's a sect of people that say you, you know avoiding gluten and dairy seems to help decrease some of the inflammation that occurs in the body and may help with brain recovery. Now. I don't know how good the evidence is. I have not looked at it recently, but Christina, have, it sounds like you're shaking your head. Maybe you can agree or disagree in that. You know, I think one of the most important things that, that might be a bit helpful in terms of recovery is actually to step back to what you alluded to previously, which was prevention. Ah, yes, my we favorite topic. Have, <laughs> have a lot of research that supports food is medicine in terms of brain injury specifically. What we do know, however, is that the healthier that your brain is, um, the better that it will recover. So the, the better that you eat nutritionally, um, avoiding uh, processed foods, avoiding tobacco, avoiding alcohol, um, completing your education, the longer that you take care of your brain prior to injury, we do have research as a medical community supporting that the brain recovers better. So I feel like if we um, were going to food focus, if you will, that it's really on, on the food that we intake before our injury that, that may assist us a little bit better. Because you're right, uh, you know, the data is sporadic uh, and interpretive, and we don't have any definitive uh, conclusions thus far. But health, all the things that are healthy for your body in general, 
fruits, vegetables, whole grains, fish with all those omega-3 and 6 and all those um, good things for your brain are good for your body, good for your brain. So good thing to, to start with. Um, we have a question here about how the brain recovers from a traumatic brain injury. And I'm not sure exactly what they're, what they're looking at here, but I would imagine they're looking for a little bit about the physiology. Do you wanna, wanna take a stab at that one? Sure, and, and you know, Christina can also answer that because I know she specializes a little bit with neuro stuff. And so let me start off, you know, the, the brain um, has multiple ways to recover. You know, in the acute phase, you wanna start recovering after the inflammatory aspect is gone away. So you, when the brain gets injured, you get cytokines, you get all these different chemicals that the body produces and causes edema that causes swelling and further injury and further breakdown of the brain. Once that starts getting better, and again, uh, alluding to something we talked about before, making sure the oxygenation is good, making sure the intracranial, so the, the pressure inside the brain is optimized, making sure your body blood pressure is optimized, making sure your glucose levels, your electrolytes are optimized, all those help with that initial recovery. Now, you also have other ways to recover, and one of them is neuroplasticity. So these neurons start growing again in areas where the neurons are destroyed or that same neuron could recover just a little bit. And so then it starts working again and thus causing the recovery. And the third way that the brain recovers is by unmasking other aspects of the brain that start taking over some of the duties that that one damaged area of the brain has. So for example, if one part of the brain is damaged, uh, in general, another part of the brain normally does not take over that function if it's working properly. But now the brain sees that one part's damaged and starts taking over some of that function. And that also helps one recover from the brain. Now, uh, we cannot forget about our great colleagues, the therapists, you know, they, they help with this recovery. So not only they help form new connections, but also help people function better as a result of all the good things we do. So shout out to our occupational therapists, speech therapists, physical therapists, our orthopods, uh, and our prosthetic folks there. Absolutely. And you know that psychologist too. Psych oh yes. The, you know, that's something when I was in medical school, you know, the brain was not considered to be something that had any real recovery or plasticity or new growth or um, all those things are kind of new, re relatively new research and new therapies. Christina, anything to add to that really great answer? Oh, you know, I, I just love the brain, so I will probably geek out on things like that. <laughs> but honestly, really nothing to add. I, I mean, you said it perfectly. The brain basically has two choices in terms of that secondary recovery, you know, not that direct physiologic trauma. The brain will either decide to reform the connection or it will reroute the connection as a means of maintaining communication. and. Um, you know, specifically, my area is uh, pediatric rehabilitation. So uh, based on the studies that we have currently, uh, our data supports that the brain actually prefers to reroute uh, versus repair uh, in the interest of forming those new connections. Yes. And that, that's one of the things we do as rehabilitation physicians is we work to encourage either option. So we want to continually remind the brain that it has this established pathway and we want to create opportunities for new growth. And that's a great intro. We're going to take a brief tour of the Avera McKinnon Hospital inpatient rehabilitation unit with nurse Carter Holm and director Jill Rye. Uh, my name is Carter Holm, and I am the son of our late prairie doctor, Dr. Richard Holm. Um, and I am here today at the Avera McKinnon Rehab Center uh, in the Prairie Center. And I'm happy to be sharing a little bit of my nursing world uh, with the viewers of On Call. So, welcome. Um, 
first, I was just curious if you would tell us a little bit about how long we've been doing uh, rehabilitation and our level of accreditation here at Avera. Very good. Thanks, Carter. Welcome, everyone, to the Inpatient Rehab Unit at Avera McKinnon. We've been a unit since 1984. We're a general rehab unit. That just means we take all kinds of patients for people with acquired disability or who have chronic diseases. Our job is to work with them and their families to get them home. Um, typically, the patients who come to the rehab unit have had strokes. Maybe they have spinal cord injuries. They're paralyzed from the neck down or the waist down. Maybe they've had a leg amputated. Maybe they've had trauma. Or maybe they've had a traumatic brain injury specifically. And then we work closely with the physical therapists who are working on making sure they get on their feet. And they're in this beautiful gym at least three hours a day to be able to work on that mobility. The occupational therapists will work with us as well to make sure that they're able to feed themselves. Maybe they have trouble getting dressed. Maybe they're not able to take a shower or even brush their teeth. So sometimes we work um, with very basic kinds of skills before they're able to move into more complex just activities of daily living and get home. People with traumatic brain injuries often have memory loss. They have a difficulty with communicating their needs and so speech therapists help them just reconnect some of those lost connections in their in their brains so they can communicate and, and work on their thought processes. A social worker is assigned to everyone and those transitions to home can be very difficult for people with traumatic brain injury. Sometimes they have behavioral needs and they need um, services even after they leave um, the rehab unit. Why is the variance between traumatic brain injuries so different? Why do we have a patient who is maybe here for six days versus a patient who can be here for several months? That's a great question, Carter. I don't think any of us knows how, how people can recover more quickly than others. We know that they go in a very specific um, uh, sequence in their, in their recovery. It is so amazing to see the kinds of things that you can do to help these patients recover, particularly the ones that have had more significant injuries. Um, so we've got a, a fair number of questions here, so I'm going to try to, to roll through some of these. So um, this kind of relates back a little bit to what we were talking about right before that great little clip about the, the rehab center. Uh, are there some areas of the brain that are more likely to regenerate than others? I think that sounds like a good question for Christina. Yeah. <laughs> if I must talk about it. <laughs> you know, I think we, we really don't have a lot of data supporting that areas recover faster uh, in terms of the different lobes of the brain, such as the parietal lobe, uh, the you know, occipital lobe, frontal lobes, uh, um, in terms of um, diagramming the brain. What we do know in relation to traumatic injury is a lot of it depends on the blood supply that is lost from the brain uh, during that time. And, and what I mean by that is, uh, you know, the brain actually isn't covered in blood. It doesn't flow through the brain in that way. The brain actually hates having blood around it. It gets very irritated. Uh, the nerves around the brain tissue, they like to be in that very clear spinal fluid um, and that's where they're the happiest so when those electrical signals that communicate through the brain have an inability to function that can really affect growth and recovery and that's why we look at where was the area of impact we get a ct scan as physicians because we want to know is there blood present in the brain if that blood is present in the brain is it going to become trapped within the skull within the brain encasing itself or within between the actual parts of the brain and it's those types of classifications that can actually predict a little bit of recovery. 
that actually leads very nicely talking about how the brain feels about blood and where it's supposed to be. There's another question from Aberdeen, uh, someone wanting to know what the difference between an MRI and an MRA is, and are they both needed and useful? Well, usually uh, we don't do MRAs, but an MRI is a magnetic image of the brain that the computer reformats and makes it look like different structures and tissues of the brain. An MRA is when you actually give some contrast and you look at the vasculature, which is seen better. Typically, when somebody has a vascular abnormality, which often we can see with the moderate and the severe brain injuries, um, a lot of surgeons would like a CT scan with the contrast or an angiogram and, and the reason behind that is they can see some of the vasculature even better. Some of the technology now in that area has improved significantly. The other thing that you want to do is uh, when somebody has a brain injury, not only can you see the vasculature, but you can see the type of damage that vasculature has and the location of it. So that will affect the treatment plan going forward in that acute phase. So, for example, if somebody has a little bit of dissection where the vessel's not very great in one area, you can go in with, this, with, uh, with the intravascular approach and just kind of use a probe and get to that area and fix it with a stent. Um, but if somebody has a really big bleed that's bleeding all over the place, you may want to go in and open up the skull and relieve the pressure, but also s potentially stop the bleeding if it's, not ble if it's not stopped already. So yes, an MRI is, is very good, but like you alluded earlier, the quickest thing to do is a CT scan because they're very good at checking bleeds. The MRI ends up being useful when you want to look at other things, such as a stroke that may occur secondarily. And sometimes that can take a little time for it to show up on a CT scan. And I think that some of those MRIs and MRAs have uses more in other fields than the traumatic brain injury. So looking for um, metastatic disease in yes. the brain or primary brain traumas or abnormal vascular p development in mm -hmm. the brain, not so much something that happened as a result of an injury, but something that was present from birth. Yes. So those, those are useful things. Um, we have a question from Redfield, who is a woman who is worried about her three and a half year old grandson who collided head on with another youngster back in April. And he still has black and blue bruising beneath his eyes. He had a CT scan and it didn't show anything unusual. Should he follow up with a physical medicine and rehabilitation doctor? What are you guys' thoughts? Is that a... I th Considering yes, his age, <laughs> he should follow up with somebody with specialized Christina. with children, and that would be somebody like Christina. So, take it. I, um, you know, that's a great question. I just uh, I want to go back to the MRI just for a minute before I forget. In that, an MRI is a very useful tool in the management of traumatic brain injury when you're looking at the tissue or the nerves that are surrounding the brain. So if there is an immediate trauma and we're evaluating a life or death situation, a CT scan is going to show, do we need to intervene on behalf of that individual or do we need to kind of watch carefully and see how they do? If that CT is negative and you continue to see behavior changes or um, abnormalities within the limbs, it is then appropriate, you know, a week later, months later, um, to get an MRI of the brain because what you may see is something called diffuse axonal injury, which has a poorer prognosis in terms of recovery related to the brain. So we do use MRIs within the setting of brain injury. It is just not within the emergent and immediate setting. Usually that first question we want to know is, do we need the neurosurgeons? Is there right. bleeding here that needs to be addressed or this could cause a life-threatening injury? And, you know, so my first question for this grandmother as a primary care physician is, 
okay, the child has bruises under the eyes, but is the child acting normally? And if the child is acting normally, this is probably not caused by something that my physical medicine and rehabilitation colleagues will address. Uh, I would think more about allergies, for example. We can get what we call allergic shiners under mm -hmm. the eyes, and it's certainly been a bad allergy season. So uh, the, the, this may be something that, uh, that the parents should take that child in to see. Start with your primary care mm -hmm. doctor, um, and then they can help decide what needs to happen next. Basic blood work may also help with noting noting allergies or are there Bleeding, low platelet counts right. or other kinds of problems. So the physical medicine and rehabilitation doctor may be the person that you need, but uh, you know, it's, it's kind of nice to get some direction and look at other possibilities. Looks like you've got something to add there, Christina. Always. And I'm, <laughs> <laughs> As providers, we will never turn you away. We, we want to help you. And, you know, just to give you a little bit of peace of mind about your grandchild is um, if this was something that was related to brain injury and it was something that needed management right away, especially, um, you know, like you were saying, Dr. Johnson, uh, you know, with it could be other things. I would really look at how how are they doing? How are they doing in school? How are they doing in their home environment? Are they moving their arms and legs? Um, you know, are, are they connecting with you? Because children that have what we call sequela of brain injury or kind of lingering type syndromes, they actually tend to worsen over time. So if the child seems to be normal otherwise, seems to be doing okay, we probably need to look for a different cause or just have fun with your grandchild. <laughs> Here's another question. This is from Sue Falls. Could a brain aneurysm in the past lead to dementia? Uh, I know that's not, not necessarily either of your areas of expertise, but I'm gonna roll that one over to you because um, that's not a child kind of question. So we gotta make sure that you get put on the spot to some. I think the short answer is no. There's no evidence that supports that. Now there's other vascular abnormalities that somebody can have that can lead to dementia going forward as they get older. But to be specific with your question, my short answer would be no. And how about brain injury? I know we kind of talked to that a little bit, but here's a, a person from Hot Springs who was concerned that her husband had fallen off a ladder um, and then at some point he had surgery and had anesthesia. Could those things have contributed to the dementia? Well, certainly the brain injury, there is some, uh, there is some evidence saying repeated brain injuries and uh, can lead to dementia, cognitive decline in the future, but there's no evidence that I know of that says anesthesia does that. Now, he could have had some smaller underlying dementia that, if, that made him fall. And often we see with people that have strokes and brain injuries that when they do get ill and they come into the hospital and they get evaluated, number one, some of that underlying dementia is unmasked and we start noticing it because we do such a thorough um, assessment of how they're doing. And the second thing is after some of those traumas to the brain, your brain may suddenly um, be under that threshold where you can manage and cope with some of the cognitive decline that has been going on gradually over the years. And I think earlier, Christina, you had mentioned that the healthier the brain is to start with, the better it recovers from these things. So if we have someone who's already a little tenuous and then they have another insult to their brain, that may slide us down that slippery slope. Um, here's another question. Uh, a woman from Lamar's had a DBS wire removed and it caused a small brain bleed. When they put it back, it caused another. She is concerned about permanent damage with this or some other kind of issue. What, what advice do you have? I know you had mentioned, Christina, that the brain does not like blood where it doesn't belong. So here's, here's a woman who had, um, had 
a medical event, a medical procedure that caused some bleeding in her brain. What, what kind of worries does she have? That's an excellent question. And to be completely honest, that is something that we would really need more information about uh, to make those types of determinations. Most of the time, and in medical terms, that means a traditional, normal, developing brain, so to speak. Um, the brain can remove that blood on its own, dependent on the amount, uh, in about two or three weeks, which is a lot of times why neurosurgeons will do follow-up imaging around 14 days to make sure that um, we're seeing a resolution of that blood wherein the body kind of takes care of itself. Honestly, um, I, I don't really have enough information. Um, I think the best response is to talk to talk with your surgeon and uh, and his team or her team and uh, get more information and particularly about how important is this device to you. We're almost out of time here. As we wrap up the show, Adil and Christina, thank you both so much for being here with us. I want some final takeaway messages. What do you want our viewers to remember? Well, just quickly, I want to also give a shout out to our rehab nurses too. I know we talked about the therapists, the nurses and the social workers are also excellent. Um, and so I wanted to give a shout out to our Vera rehab folks there. But one takeaway message is no brain injury is going to be like the one you've heard of or one that you've experienced or one that you've seen in other people. Everybody's different. And sometimes people get better faster. Sometimes people get better slower. Sometimes people present in these numerous facets. So family help, being patient, being diligent, continuing to see specialists, is very important going forward. It's very important to take care of your mental health also. Christina, what's your takeaway message? You know, my takeaway message would be what I tell my children at home and what I tell my children in the clinic. And that is that we really only do get one brain. And up until the age of two, the brain itself in structure continues to develop. And then really up until the age of what we're finding is 26, those lobes of the brain are developing. So within so protect your, brain, your brain, that's the message, protect your brain. As protective as you can. The winner of our drawing tonight is Diane Dieterman from Lamars, Iowa. Thank you, Diane, for asking a question during the first 20 minutes of the show. A gift will be sent to you soon. We'll be back after this. This has been House Call with Issues of the Heart. It is presented in good faith as the best medical knowledge we now possess. I'd like to thank our physician expert panel for their words of wisdom and thank you for joining us. What I remember most is the silence. She was 19 years old, just starting her first semester of college. She'd been transferred to our level one trauma center, intubated and in a medically induced coma. I was a third year medical student being introduced to the realities of medicine. Our team was clustered around her in the procedure room adjacent to the ICU while my senior resident inserted the central line we would use to quickly administer large volumes of medicine and fluids. ICUs can be busy, noisy places. This ICU was a large open room with rows of beds surrounded by all the equipment needed to care for critically ill and injured patients. The sounds of machines whirring and beeping, of doctors and nurses and all the support staff accompanied us in that little windowless procedure room. The neurosurgery team solemnly filed through the door, their eyes grim. They'd reviewed her CT scan. The pressure of the blood accumulating inside her skull had forced the base of her brain downward into the space usually occupied 
only by the top of the spinal cord. We stared at each other in silence. We'd already lost the battle. During the next few days, I watched her 20-year-old sister support their parents as we walked through the process of declaring brain death and deciding on organ donation. Other than the silence, the sister's grief and her courage are my most potent memories. Over the years, I've seen many lives irrevocably altered by brain injuries. Children thrown from their bicycles, soldiers caught in blasts, women battered by their partners, seniors who slip and fall. Some patients fight to regain skills that were once effortless. Some succumb to their injuries or the consequences. The lucky ones sometimes don't even realize how close they came to having their lives upended. Our ability to help has improved significantly in the nearly 30 years since I stood at that young woman's bedside. People survive injuries that would previously have been fatal. People recover enough to rejoin the community instead of finishing their days in nursing homes. Nevertheless, too many still die. Over 50,000 Americans every year Nevertheless, survivors spend months relearning basic skills with the help of skilled therapists. Nevertheless, millions live with varying degrees of disability despite aggressive rehabilitation. As with so many things, the best treatment is prevention. Buckle your children into their car seats. Use your seatbelt. Wear your helmet. Keep the guns locked up. Learn how to reduce the risk of falls, especially for the young and the old. It's much better to protect that fragile brain than to try to put it back to rights. My heartfelt thanks to our guests, Christina and Adel, for volunteering their time to help us learn more about current treatments available for people with traumatic brain injury. As we continue to celebrate our 20th season, we are inviting you, our viewing audience, to tell us how this program has made a difference in your life. Please email or mail your story to the addresses on the screen. If you would like to see and hear more episodes of this program, please like and follow us on Facebook and YouTube or visit us at prairiedoc.org. Look for Prairie Doc Perspectives in your local newspaper and be sure to look for the podcast of this program, Prairie Doc On Call, wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you again for inviting us into your home as we celebrate our 20th season of truthful, tested, and timely medical information. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. What is the secret of long life? Just keep breathing. But that can be difficult. Asthma, COPD, lung cancer, COVID-19, they can interfere. Breathe in, breathe out. Next time on Call with the Prairie Doc, celebrating our 20th season. Hello, my name is Dr. Ken Bartholomew from Pier, and I serve on the Healing Words Foundation Board. This year we celebrate the 20th season of the Prairie Doc, created by my friend, the late Dr. Rick Holm. I watched as the Prairie Doc TV, radio, and newspaper programs were created, and now I watch as the legacy continues. Countless professionals donate their time to bring timely, trusted, truthful medical information free to the public without advertising spin or bias. As a native of Lemon, South Dakota, I realize how important this is, particularly to people in rural areas. You can help sustain the work of the Prairie Doc. Truthful, tested, timely information for 20 seasons. Please consider a charitable gift to the Healing Words Foundation, a 501c3 corporation. Go to prairiedot.org and donate today. And thank you.
Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Dock has been provided by. Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call with the Prairie Dock on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Dock as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individual and institutions. Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Avera Heart Hospital, First Bank and Trust, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Vance Thompson Vision, Monument Health, Black Hills Medical Society, Brookings Medicine, Flandreau District Medical Society, Pier District Medical Society, Yankton District Medical Society, Orthopedic Institute, Lake Poinsett Sailing Academy, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Dakota Bank, South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftville Communications.